This is Support is Sexy, episode 256, with Daisha Bastien, co-founder of Shade Management. Welcome to Support is Sexy. I'm your host, Elaine Fluker, entrepreneur, author, and founder of Chic Rebellion Media. Five days a week, Monday through Friday, I interview inspiring women entrepreneurs who share their wins and their lessons to help you take your business and your life to the next level and create something sexy. Here we go. Hi, everyone. Welcome to a new episode of Support is Sexy. I'm excited to have you here. It just would not be the same without you. And today I am excited because I learned so much on this episode, a conversation with Daisha Bastien, who is the co-founder of Shade Management. And I learned a lot because this episode is all about the influencer market. We've all heard about influencers. Either people want to be an influencer or they already call themselves influencer. But what exactly is that? That is what Daisha talks to us about today and about her very innovative, which I absolutely love, her company Shade Management, which is really disrupting the influencer market because her company focuses on representing influencers of color, who are people that brands don't often, well, they might look to, but they don't often engage in the same way that they might other people or other influencers, people that they may overlook who really have passionate audiences. You know, it's a resource that really hadn't been tapped into in this way. And Daisha talks to us about the influencer market overall, but the importance of really finding your niche. You know, they say the riches are in the niches, finding your niche and serving that niche well and being the best in your category, no matter what your niche is or what your market is, being the best is key. So on this episode, what we learned from Daisha is the importance of testing your market, how to know when you're onto something with your new business, finding a gap in the market and seeing if you're passionate about filling it, taking action before you're quote unquote ready. You know, we talk about that a lot on this podcast. Also, what it really means to be an influencer, the three most important qualities of successful influencers, what Daisha says is the average rate for influencer campaigns, her advice for new influencers, so if you're just breaking into the market or you want to, you want to definitely listen to this. What people misunderstand about the influencer market, people like me, and also when it's time to pivot from one business idea to the next, which isn't always easy, but sometimes it's necessary. So I know you're going to enjoy this conversation with Daisha. And for more, you can go to supportissexypodcast.com and just type in Daisha, D A H. CIA and her show notes page will pop up with all of the resources there. All right. So now without further ado, Daisha Bastien. So Daisha, thank you so much for joining us for an episode of Support is Sexy. I'm excited to talk to you. Thanks so much for having me. I'm so excited. Absolutely. So first question, when did you first fall in love with entrepreneurship? Wow. Um, I think I fell in love with entrepreneurship before I even knew what being an entrepreneur meant. Um, I was in college um, and I met my then boyfriend, currently my husband, uh, and he was working as a freelancer uh, while in school. And I knew like, you know, people owned businesses, people were small business owners, but I didn't really understand the concept of entrepreneurship until um, I think it was my junior year and his senior year. Um, He was trying to decide whether or not he was going to go full time into his business or get a job. And I was like, well, is that even an option? (laughs) (laughs) Don't, aren't you here to get a job? (laughs) Right. Um, and so we, you know, started to talk about that and talk, talked a little bit about his journey so far as a freelancer and, you know, some of the stuff that I was helping him with, with his business. And he started talking, saying this word entrepreneurship. And I was like, well, what is that? And, To me, uh, from what I saw from him, it meant like a freedom to create, a freedom to create something that's your own. Um, You don't have any constraints or limitations. It doesn't necessarily matter what degree you have. Um, And so I was like, wow, this is an interesting idea. Um, So I started talking to a lot of my other friends who were dabbling in entrepreneurship um, while we were in school, whether some people, you know, had their own nail salon on campus or, you know, did hair and things like that. And I was like, wow. People are really doing this. Like, mm-hmm. you don't have to be a 
Bill Gates or uh, Mark Zuckerberg to be an entrepreneur. You can, you know, create your own. You have the freedom to create anything. Um, so th that was kind of the time when I really realized um, what entrepreneurship meant. And kind of, it, that kind of propelled me into knowing that I wanted more out of my education beyond just getting a job, which um, at the time I was working at the New York State Assembly and I was going to be working in government for a while. So I kind of started looking for little instances of that freedom to create. What school were you attending at the time? Uh, I was at the university at Albany, um, and that's a SUNY upstate New York. And you were, were you studying to go into a position in government? You said you sort of had that in mind before this was all disrupted. Um, yeah, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> not really. I, I, I guess I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, I was studying, I got a degree in English and communication. Mm -hmm. um, and I was like, yeah, I'm going to do that because I can kind of do anything with English and communication. Um, but I fell into uh, government um, and policy. And that was something that I actually did have a passion for. Um, and so I got an internship and then started, you know, ra rising in the ranks. And I became a legislative aide for a New York State legislator. Now, did you grow up in Albany? No, actually. Um, I grew up in Yonkers, which is uh, lower Westchester County. It's in New York, mm -hmm. um, about 30 minutes outside of New York City um, for people who geographically need uh, kind of assistance with that. <laughs> um, but I, I was born in Jamaica, actually, um, and my parents immigrated to the United States when I was two years old. Um, and we've been living in Westchester County since, and then I went to Albany for school. What was a young Daisha like growing up in Yonkers? <laughs> what was I like? I was inquisitive. That was the word that all of my aunts and uncles um, used to say to me. And I, when I was younger, I really didn't know what they were talking about. I just always loved to ask why. I loved to question things. Mm -hmm. um, and kind of understand a, the deeper meaning behind certain things. Um, I loved, loved, loved traveling when I was younger. I always wanted to get on a plane. When, when I was younger, obviously, we came to America from Jamaica on a plane. And every summer or just about, we went back um, to Jamaica to visit family and friends and stuff like that. So that was, those two things were something that I don't, I don't think has ever left me. But when I was younger, they were very, very pervasive in my life. Um, my parents called me inquisitive. They told me I asked too many questions. Um, and <laughs> that was their nice way of saying you asked too many questions. Yeah, li literally. <laughs> <laughs> Who were some of your greatest influences growing up? Um, I'm going to bring it back to my parents. I think um, they really showed me what true hard work was. Um, both my mom and my dad, you know, working full time, raising, trying to raise their five children. The reason they came to America was to give us a better life and a better, better education. And I think at a young age, I realized that very quickly. Um, so I was like, I need to be a straight A student. I have to show my parents that their hard work is not in vain. Um, I can't be anything less than excellent. And I think that that's what has propelled me so far in my life and in my career and a lot of people are like well you're really young you're only 25 like you don't have to have your life together and I was like no I usually say no I don't but why not you know why not plan ahead why not try to do as much as I can to be as successful as I can be to be able to provide or, or turn around and um, uplift my parents who worked so hard for me I think you know my mom she went back to school when I was in middle school, ending middle school, going into high school, she went to get her degree. Um, she's the oldest of 11 kids. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and she wasn't able to complete her um, college degree. So she went back to school when I was in middle school. She had, you know, I was the youngest, but she had five kids and she had two full-time jobs and she was doing it. She graduated cum laude um, and we were all at her graduation. And it was a very ex inspiring thing for me. Um, personally to see that someone that I look up to, you know, obviously my mother, but someone to, who took everything that went, that they went through in their life and just turned that around and be able to go and say that she's a college graduate and get a better job and make a better life for her family. And, you know, I think that really influenced and inspired me to do what I'm doing. 
That's such a power. Thank you for sharing that. It's such a powerful story, too, about determination. You know, a lot of us now say, oh, I don't have time to do the things that we really want to do. But here your mom right. is the mother of five children, you know, raising her family, working two jobs, going to school, still getting right. it done, graduating. Cum laude. It's possible. Right. You can find right. a way. Right. And as a woman, I think that that shows a lot in our strength and resilience. And I I think that a lot of times we take it for granted. We take for granted how strong we are, how, even how much time we have in mm -hmm. a day. Um, and it's not to say that, you know, resting and relaxing isn't something that's needed. I'm, I've been like introduced to this thing called self-care and right. I can't stop. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so, so that's definitely something that I'm a, a very big advocate for. But I think um, just, you know, reflecting back on my life and like the women who came before me, my, my mother is one of nine uh, sisters, you know, so all of my aunts are, you know, doing something that's extraordinary. And I just look at that. And I'm like, I can't be anything less than that, you know, <laughs> that's amazing. So now tell me, though, once you get you're in college, we're back at college now, and mm -hmm. you start to have this glimpse of entrepreneurship, was this something that you shared with your family of that? Hey, I'm thinking about doing this at that time, or because I know a lot of well, all parents, but especially um, people that I know who have immigrant immigrant parents talk about there was no usually no idea of entrepreneurship. It was you have to go to school and get a good job. And this is why we came here and that kind of thing. Yes, exactly. Um, you know, you hit the nail right on the head. That was not something I communicated with my parents. Um, I talked to my sisters about it, my older sisters. Um, you know, I talked to my brother about it. They, they obviously were a little bit more in my age group to mm -hmm. kind of be able to understand different ways of making money and creating an income and a life for yourself. But my parents were very you know, you're going to go to school, you're going to get a job or go, go to grad school. And then, you know, you're going to start your life. So that was kind of the pathway that was expected of me. And I think you're, you're absolutely right. Um, as immigrants, they, there was no chances, there was no risk, you know, you, you need to do the thing that's tried and true. Um, and the, you know, surefire way to attain uh, some sort of income. But as a millennial, and you know, a lot of us experience this, the hiring when we were graduating from college was not the easiest thing to do, you know, finding a job, finding a good enough job to support you and to be able to rise in the ranks. Um, at the time, you know, we were going through a recession, mm -hmm. the country was not in the best state um, economically. So I think um, I shared it a little bit. Um, but the person that I really talked to a, um, you know, about with it more was my uh, boyfriend at the time. And we talked about different ways to find different avenues of income. You, yeah, I'm working at the New York State Assembly, but I'm doing that nine to five. What else can I do in my free time or on the weekends um, to be able to kind of explore this uh, idea that I had to create something or to um, work on an idea that was my own? Excellent. So then when did Shade.co become the thing? So Shade actually um, was born out of a, another company, which is Boogie, which is the company that my husband and I currently run, a marketing agency. Boogie, um, I love that. <laughs> yeah, that's our name. Um, and that's, it's actually an, what a nickname that my husband used to have when he was, he used to be a break dancer. So that's kind uh, of the story. Uh-oh. <laughs> um, Dancing, I love it. So yeah, so Boogie was um, once his design firm, and then we kind of um, got together after I was still working at the New York State Assembly. But you know, on the weekends during my free time, I used to help him and we decided let's turn this into a full marketing agency. Let's provide, you know, comprehensive marketing services to small businesses. Um, at that time, it was in the Albany area, um, more, you know, specifically, but we had a few clients outside of that. Um, and I kind of assume the role of like a uh, strateg strategist or marketing strategist. Um, and that was my role for a few years. Um, and during, while we were working, um, we decided and realized that there was a lot more that we could do with marketing. There was a lot more that we can create a product because we understand the marketing behind it. We can, I mean, create and successfully sell a product. We can do a bunch of different things, but fast forward to like, I think seven months ago, um, we started talking a little bit more about influencer marketing, which is uh, kind of a new space when it comes to, you know, in the marketing world. 
Um, and there are a lot of like full celebrities now, people who are Instagram stars, YouTube stars and things like that. And we were working with them because a lot of the brands that we worked with under Boogie, um, you know, including brands like Kinky Curly, like the NBA, um, you know, smaller clients like Haddad Brands, we were working with them to seek out influencers that would promote their products or promote their brands. Um, and with that said, uh, we, because being black business owners, we automatically wanted to see representation in the campaigns that we were doing. So whatever marketing and advertising campaign we did that required casting of an influencer or even just a regular person, um, we were more inclined to cast black and brown people alongside their white counterparts. And we were more intentional about that, about diversity in the advertising that we were doing. Um, and a part of that led to shade because some of those influencers, some of those models, you know, people that were doing the promotions with us, they came back to us and were like, wow, this is the first time I've ever gotten paid for a gig. Or how do I get more gigs like this where, you know, people want me to promote their products? I have X amount of followers on Instagram or I have this many subscribers on YouTube. What should I do? At that time, obviously, we were a marketing agency, so we weren't trying to dabble in like any sort of management or consultancy for influencers. Mm -hmm. um, but eventually, I started to talk to Jacques about building our own um, separate, like kind of like a sister company or a child, a subsidiary under Boogie, um, which would be a management agency um, to help manage these black and brown influencers, give them direction and guide them um, on how they can make money from their influence. We have influencers like Kim Kardashian that are making millions of dollars per post promoting a brand. Why can't our uh, black and brown counterparts who have similar following or even less, but a very dedicated audience do the same? That's excellent. So when did you, so when did you came out of school in what year, 2008 or so? 2012. Um, 2012. I graduated 2012. Yeah. Okay. And then, so how long you started shade? You said about seven months ago. Yeah. Seven months ago. So how have we been, Sorry, go yeah, ahead. Go. No, I was just saying we've been running Boogie. You know, in between that, we were kind of finding our footing uh, with Boogie, you know, working with our marketing clients and stuff like that. And then Shade was born out of that seven months ago. So how do you, um, how has the response been, do you think, um, in the past seven months with having the company reaching out to influencers and from brands? Do you have a sense so far of, of whether it's working? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think the response has been, much more than what we expected. I think when we first thought about it, we were like, okay, this is something nice that we can just start and run as kind of like a side project, something that is a passion project for us, but not necessarily something that we would de devote all of our time to. And we were very mistaken. Um, you know, within about three months of us just launching the website and the Instagram page, we had almost 200 applicants, mm. influencers who applied to be represented or managed by our um, company. And this was without doing any paid promotions, you know, just we put up the Instagram, created a bio and started posting some pictures. Um, we created a very simple one page website uh, with a form for influencers who wanted to be represented by us and then a short form for brands who were interested in learning more about our services. We just were kind of testing the market out and it blew up. And that was something that we weren't we weren't really expecting, um, mm -hmm. I wasn't expecting. Um, so we kind of had to shift a little bit um, and I started leading the company um, in terms of the marketing side. And so I've been dealing direct, directly with brands and um, with some of the influencers in terms of campaigns. And we've, we've done a, a, good, a fair amount of campaigns so far. You know, we've worked with Sally Beauty, um, Square Cash, um, names are at a loss right now, but uh, Ara Hostel, um, Daniel Welch. That's amazing in, se in <laughs> seven months. Right. So, um, and these, these, um, these campaigns that we're doing with these brands, usually they're not necessarily coming to us saying that, oh, we want to cast a diverse influencer for X and X. This is, this is more so, I love this influencer style and he or she is on your roster. Can you send me some more information about how this promotion can go down? Um, and so that's kind of what we want to really hone in on about Shade. Um, a lot of the brands that have reached out to us, brands and agencies, because we've also made a few partnerships with some agencies um, locally in the New York City area, but also beyond that, um, some global, global agencies who are casting for huge campaigns like 
you know, with bigger companies like Clinique and um, things of that nature. And one of the reasons why they are a little bit more trustworthy in our services is one, we ran a marketing agency for years prior, or, and we're currently still running that agency. But the second reason is we understand the market. Yes, the diversity is important, and it's super important to me. Like I said, this is my passion project, but it's really, when it comes down to it, is the work going to get done? If I want this product promoted, can I come to your agency and have that product promoted properly? Um, can I depend uh, and be reliant that your content will be high quality? It will be, um, you know, promoted in its best light, et cetera, et cetera. So these are some of the things that we consistently talk to brands and agencies about. And what we found um, is that people were looking for something like this in the space. A lot of brands that are trying to be more purposeful about diversity, um, as we know with things that are going on in the world, they are looking for something like Shade to be able to pick and choose from high quality influencers who are black and brown. I have so many questions, Daisha. You just dropped so many just excellent tips and advice within just telling your story. Um, one of the things I think is great is that you, it sounds like you guys sort of found a gap within the space, you know, within the marketing right. space, I mean, and just looking at, well, like you said, something that was already a passion for you or something that you um really are are dedicated to doing as far as diversity and inclusion. Mm -hmm. So for people listening, I just wanted to share this idea of looking at where the spaces are, where the gaps are, and then what are you really passionate about? You know, we, it has to be a combination, as you said, too, of being good at what you do. There's always mm -hmm. that as well. But it yeah. sounds like you sort of combined all of those things to create this brand. And then another thing that you mentioned, this idea of I always tell people, take action. Like you said, you put up a one page, you know, you put up the form and that kind of thing, <laughs> and then it expands later, but you still launched and took action, even maybe before yeah. you were, quote unquote, ready. I ready, know, right. right? Yeah, yeah, I was going to ask, do you think that, yeah, even before you're ready, that is such a, a great thing to look at and then seeing the response how you you know you said you saw if if influencers got back to you and if the company said that they were interested in coming to you even not necessarily looking for people of color to be influencers just because of you doing great work and that kind of thing so right right and that's that's so super important and I think that's something that I had to learn it wasn't something that came natural to me to launch before you're ready I'm so I'm such a perfectionist right. I like no, that doesn't look right. We need to move this over here. We need to change this question or, you know, change the font on that. And it's kind of when you're, when you're in the marketing space, but then as an entrepreneur as well, you have to kind of let go of something that you consider your baby and just put it out into the world right. and just see how it's received. And then you can go ahead and pivot and um, make any changes later based on that. You know, at least you have some actual real genuine feedback to then be able to make changes. Because if it's all in your head, no one's ever going to know what you plan. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's super important. That's a super important point. And there's so, so much learning in action, do you think? Like you sort of yeah. learn, yeah, what, what people want to know or what kind of, even what, for me, I know my thing is putting things out there to learn what kind of questions people have. Because I know exactly what I'm thinking. But when people start right. asking you questions, like I love your, and for everyone listening, of course, I'm sure people want to know, I will have a link to it. It's shade.co, but also to your 411 PDF that tells all about the yeah. program and how it works. It's so great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it has personality, but then all the information and the questions that you would have about it are all in there. Right, right. And I think that's something that's very important. That that actually took us a while. Mm -hmm. We, you know, we were like going back and forth with it. My husband and I were like, okay, well, people would want to know this, but we can't tell them everything in just this small PDF. We would want to need to get on a phone call with them to explain more. But scalability is also important to us. We have 100 applicants. We can't get on a phone call with every single one of mm -hmm. them. So um, that's a that's a very, very good point. When it comes to our decks and things that we're putting out into the world, we have to be very, very purposeful and, and, and explore what are some questions that people would have about a new service or a new product that you have that you're providing to the world. So it sounds like you, you guys work with, well, obviously you work with the brands, but you also mentioned that you manage the influencers. So it's, you'll mm -hmm. have a certain number of uh, influencers that you work with uh, consistently. So it's not just a brand comes to you and you go out and find an influencer. Is that right? 
Right. That's that's absolutely right. So we provide a um, twofold services. We work with influencers in two different capacities. Mm -hmm. The first one is just representation, where it's kind of a non-exclusive agreement between ourselves and the influencers that as campaigns come across our desk, we will cast them for those campaigns if they fit um, the brief. So, for example, if someone's looking for uh, an influencer that's vegan and shares vegan recipes on their um, profile, on their social media pages, we would then, um, we have a roster of about 300 people right now um, that are interested in being represented by us. So as we go through that roster and identify, okay, this person is vegan, they share vegan recipes, we can pass this person on to the brand. Um, and then that's one, so that's one agreement that we have with influencers. And the second agreement is a more management, which you kind of touched on um, when you were just introducing uh, me and kind of like our services, is we partner directly with that influencer to grow their online brand. Um, so some influencers who maybe didn't even know that they were influencers. So we kind of like scouted them like a talent agency would scout a model. Um, maybe they had 3,000 followers and they didn't, you know, they hadn't made it, quote unquote, yet. Um, they had maybe 5,000 followers. We had an influencer who had about uh, 3,000 followers when we first started working with them. And now they're about at the 10,000 mark. Um, and what we did was we helped them grow their audience, you know, um, expand their brand online, you know, help them to create high quality content, um, provided them with tips on marketing themselves. And that's something that we provide to brands on our agency side all the time. So we were able to kind of reshift that service and provide it to those influencers. Um, and then the final thing that we do for them, we obviously pitch and cast them for campaigns as well. But the final thing we do for them, which is something that's more near and dear to my heart, is working with them to make money, get paid by doing the things that they love. So establishing some sort of income generation for them that stems from their online influence. So basically, for example, we have a chef who's on our roster and we're working with him to create an ebook and that uh, e cookbook. Mm -hmm. And that cookbook he can then sell to his audience and that's going to generate some residual income for him um, you know as, on a reoccurring basis so that he can make some money from him, his influence while also doing brand campaigns as well um, or another example is we have a fitness influencer who soon will be traveling um, will uh, create a traveling series for her where she'll be hosting a fitness class in different cities where her audience is and her audience will buy tickets to attend that fitness class. We still get brands involved in things like this where the brand can host, let's say someone like Nike or Reebok can then, you know, pay some sort of sponsorship fee or provide some sort of goodie bag or grab bag um, item. But this is for that influencer to make money directly from her audience and directly or his or her audience and um, their influence. I love that you sort of provide, not sort of, you do provide coaching for um, your influencers of how other ways to build their brand. It's not just through the one channel of working with a certain brand to promote it on their social media platforms. Like you said, the right. book and the classes, that's genius. Yeah, that's something that's super important to us. And we want to get more into that as, you know, we can only sustain a few management, uh, a few influencers that we manage right now we manage um i think 35 exclusively wow. um, but there's only so much that we can sustain mm -hmm. so that's why we introduced a secondary um service which was the representation which is non-exclusive we don't necessarily work with those influencers on you know something else a, a separate business uh venture but we do still cast them for campaigns and pitch them for to brands now, for the thing, the other pro the ancillary projects that you work on with your influencers, do you also get a percentage of whatever they do for, say, the ebook and that kind of thing, or do you just help them develop that for themselves, just from the business mm -hmm. side? Yeah, exactly. So that's something, you know, it's so interesting because when something is a passion project, it's so hard to decide, like, I oh, I, I'm gonna get money from this. I'm yes, gonna, charge but you have this. to. You have to, right? <laughs> yes. Maybe. Um, so we had to kind of um, figure out how we're going to um, negotiate that because depending on who the influencer is, you know, you could be making maybe $100 per fitness class or you could only be making $5 per cookbook or mm -hmm. something like that. Um, so each of our influencers, we have some sort of profit share with them when it comes to whatever we're developing with them. 
Um, and for some, it's going to be super ben beneficial for them to do it directly with us because they may not have the resources, the legal resources or the marketing resources to be able to uh, execute it on their own. Um, so that's kind of the, what I always tell my influencers is that our service is free. But when you make money, we make money. So our incentive is to help you make the most money you can so that we can make some of that money too. Right. Um, so that's kind of the way that we go about it. Could a brand come to you, say, if someone had a book or something or a product, obviously, if that they're releasing, but could a brand that's a smaller, you know, say it's a one project thing, come to mm -hmm. you and say, hey, I have this book or whatever that I want to promote. Can you have your influencers promote this thing? Is it like that? Or do you just work with bigger brands on campaigns? Uh, no, we definitely work with smaller brands as well. Um, we try not to do like a per post basis because that gets a little bit too tedious mm -hmm. um, to track certain things. So campaigns are usually easier for us to work with because we can work within a budget and then do multiple things throughout, let's say, a month period or, you know, whatever the case may be. But mm -hmm. we do work with brands on um, uh, smaller scale projects where it's like maybe just a product launch or a book launch, like you said, um, and they just want promotion for that launch period. Um, we have done things like that where it's just like, for example, um, uh, I think the promotion that we did with Square Cash was just like a one-off. Um, I think we got about eight of our influencers involved and each of them did one post promoting Square Cash. Mm -hmm. So that was, you know, something similar. Now, what does it take, Daisha, to be considered an influencer? <laughs> That's such a great question. Inquiring minds want to know. And it's part, right. It's such a difficult question because I think everyone is an influencer in their own right. Mm -hmm. Um, I think whether you're influencing the masses with the Supportive Sexy podcast or you're influencing your little sister because she looks up to you and the things that you wear and the things that you buy. Um, so I think everyone can be an influencer and it's not necessarily all about the numbers, even though um, a lot of brands and marketing professionals will lead you to believe that. They'll lead you to believe like, yo, you have to have 100,000 followers to be considered an influencer. But that's not necessarily true. I think it's more... Um, about the ratio. So if you have many more followers than you are following, that gives you a sense that that person is some, some way, in some way, shape, or form influential. Um, and then the other thing is that you have some sort of substance in the content that you provide and people are looking to you for that specific thing. Whether you're an expert at cooking or you're an esthetician or you're an author or a speaker, you have some sort of tangible skill that you're able to provide to your audience um, and they're consistently looking to you for that content. Um, I think that really is what we try to do when we identify quote unquote influencers. What would you say are the three um, qualities that you see in your most successful influencers on your roster? Of course, you don't have to tell us who, but uh, <laughs> what would you say has been has been the things, the three things that you feel really work for influencers? I think that the three most important things for influencers to have qualities for influencers to have are um, to be authentic, you know, um, there's so much clutter when it comes to the space nowadays where people are just every post is a promotion, every post is sponsored, every post is paid, where you one day you're promoting Colgate and the next day you're promoting Crest. It's kind of like, mm, OK, I thought you used Colgate. Mm -hmm, so right. that, that, that's very um, important. I think uh, it's important to be authentic um, and to be very genuine with your audience. So you're promoting things, products that you actually stand behind, even if it's not something that you, you used before until the brand reached out to you, but you actually tried the product before saying, this is such a great product, everybody buy this. Um, so that's important, authenticity. I think also having high quality content is very, very important. Increasingly what brands are doing with influencer um, content is they're repurposing it for ads, they're repurposing it for commercials, you know, things of that nature. So having that high quality content is really, really, really going to allow people, uh, influencers to be successful in what they do. And then um, the last one, which we've seen in a lot of the influencers that we work with is the willingness to learn. Willingness to, if I know, if I'm telling you as the expert in the space that this is not working or you should attempt to do it this way instead, that you are willing to learn and change and shift based on that advice that we're providing with providing you with um, so that you can improve your content and get better um, over time. Be coachable. 
Right. Mm-hmm. right. What would you say is the average amount an influencer can make? I'm sure there's a range, but what is, is there a, say, standard industry fee, for example? Yeah. Um, the industry is like the wild, wild west. Mm-hmm. Um, people don't really know what to charge or what to pay for influencer marketing um, as it stands right now. Uh, so we developed our own pricing model. And what we do is for each of our influencers, we don't do any engagements lower than $1,000 per uh, influencer. And that's a campaign. So it doesn't mean you're paying $1,000 for a post. But it does mean that you are guaranteeing high quality content because things that people don't keep in mind are um, the content has to be filmed or, you know, whether it's a videographer or photographer, the content has to then be edited. You know, this you might have to scout a location for that and maybe pay for a location. So things like that are things that factor into the cost. And depending on the brief, it really varies. We've seen campaigns between $1,000 and $90,000. But that really depends on the brief and the commitment time. You know, the $90,000 uh, uh, commitment that I'm referring to, it was a year-long contract with a brand to become basically their brand ambassador, appear in certain commercials, also do, you know, produce content on a regular, you know, a consistent basis. So that was um, that compensation. But a lot of times um, when it comes to working on campaigns with our influencers and with the uh, respective brands, what we do is we work with the brand's budget. And that's sometimes hard for people to wrap their minds around, especially in the marketing space, because they're like, wait, what do you mean? You don't have a minimum? And it's like, yeah, we do have a minimum, but we can kind of cater and alter our campaign based on what you have to spend. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's kind of where we go uh, in terms of that. And I know it's um, public information in your the PDF that we talked about that the split is usually 65 um 65 for shade and 35 35 for the influencer is that standard for for how you work with most of your influencers or does it vary uh it that actually was a joke um it's it's 35 for shade and 65 for the influencer oh we got it backwards (laughs) no i think the first joke wasn't it like 95 percent for shade and then right Right, i got it backwards i'm sorry no no that's fine um so we did make kind of like try to make it a little bit fun because it's always difficult, I think, to talk about pricing models and, um, you know, pricing when it comes to, especially people who don't necessarily know the industry um, when it comes to influencers. Influencers are regular people and they might be like, wait, what? That's a lot of money to take 35%. Um, But at the same time, we think that the service that we're providing is worth it. You know, if we're going to try to get you the most money for whatever campaign we're working with you on, we are going to make sure that you also get the most money out of that. So it is a 65-35 split where the influencer makes 65%. um, And it's not necessarily an industry standard. We've seen ranges between like 15 to about 30-35%. But it sounds like you're providing so much more, sorry to interrupt, so much more value though. Yeah, so we decided to kind of go on the higher scale, but exactly what you said, we provide a little bit more value than um, than people would normally get from an agency or a management company uh, that they would be uh, typically working with. So that's that's one of the reasons, kind of to cover our costs. Uh, we also provide our influencers with our team. Um, we have designers, we have developers, mm-hmm. photographers, you know, things like that that are going to provide content or uh, provide them with the ability to create content for at scale for free um, at, you know, obviously when we have a campaign, then we get paid. So that's kind of our incentive to continuously get our influencers paid. Now, for anyone who is just starting out who might want to be an influencer or figure out if they are an influencer, what would you say in your experience are three must haves for them for people who are in the early stages? Um, I think if you're in the early stages um, and you're interested in becoming an influencer, you should want to find um, an industry that you want to focus on. So if you want to be a motivational speaker or if you want to be a skincare influencer or whatever the case may be, first you have to identify what you want to do, what content you want to share. And then the second thing I think is to start creating content. It might not be the most high quality now. It might not be the most... um, uh, valuable, I guess, to your audience right this second. But as you're building your audience, as you're hearing from them, you know, in terms of what they want, 
or what they're inter- interested in because people do comment on other people's content and say, well, can you share more information about X or tell me more about Y? But once you're um, considered, once you consider yourself an expert, and I think anyone can become an expert, there's Google is free. Um, Mm -hmm. So uh, you can read up on whatever industry that you want to be in. Um, So that's one, identify that that industry. But second, start creating that content. Start creating those YouTube videos or, you know, Instagram posts or whatever it is, whatever platform you would like to focus on. Start doing that and eventually improve your content and work hard to... to make sure that your content is valuable to someone, even if it's just one person at the current state that you're in. If it's just one person, make sure you're providing as much value as you can. If it's a thousand people that are following you, make sure you're providing as much value as you can. And as an influence, I think social influencers are interesting because you have kind of like a, it's, you're, you become a, a, a uh, celebrity in your own right. Mm-hmm. So people want to see your everyday and your day to day. And some people are not necessarily the most com- comfortable with that. But share things, share what you're doing on the weekend, or how you're improving yourself by going to X class, or um, you maybe you work out in the morning, because that gets you in the right state of mind to be able to do, you know, whatever it is that you're doing, then share those things. And when you consistently share more people are going to want to see more. Um, and then that'll keep you accountable, you know, to create better content and more content consistently. Very good. Now, what would you say that you look for as a company in an ideal influencer? Again, is it about the numbers or what is the thing that usually, because you said sometimes you you all uh, talent scout, it's not only people who apply. So what yeah. draws you to influencers? Um, I think... The biggest thing for us is showing that the influencer has some sort of substance uh, to their content. So they, like I said before, it doesn't necessarily have to be a numbers game where you have, you know, X amount of followers or, you know, you are following X amount of people. So that must mean that you're an influencer. Mm -hmm. But if you have the content, if you have some substance and the content to go along with it, you might not be be producing the most high quality stuff, but you're telling people how to take care of their hair or you're showing people how to manage their money or, you know, whatever the case may be. And you're consistently doing that. And we see that you have somewhat of an engaged audience. We will then, you know, take a look a little bit further. Usually what we do when people apply or when we're looking for a, a new influencer for something, we will scout their profiles for about a two week period. Um, so to see their growth over a two week period, but also to see their content, you know, their production schedule, how often they're creating that content, how engaged their audience is, um, calculating their engagement rate and, and things like that. And then from there, we'll make a decision as to whether we can provide some value to them. Um, and that's very important to us. We don't want to just get into a relationship that is one sided. So we, you know, we make sure that it's mutually be- beneficial. If you are, sh- you know, you're an influencer, you're, you've been producing content for the last three years, but you just can't be- grow your audience beyond 5,000 followers. You don't know what's wrong. You just hit a wall. We can provide some sort of value to help you increase your, um, your, your followers. But at the same time, you're creating super high quality content then we- that we can then pitch to brands. Mm-hmm. So in some way, this is a mutually beneficial relationship where we want to make sure the influencer is getting something out of it. What do you feel like people misunderstand about the influencer market, whether the influencer themselves or even brands and how it works? <laughs> I think that's a, a superb question. <laughs> I think there's a lot to misunderstand about influencer marketing because it's such a new space. And it's like I said, it's the wild, wild west. People mm-hmm. make own prices make their own you know whatever they want to do they do there are some people some influencers who will approach um you know to cast for a campaign and they'll be like we don't charge any less than twenty thousand dollars for a youtube video okay cool and then some influencers will be like okay i charge fifty dollars for a youtube video so it's very very widespread and um there's not really any rate card or a sheet that that will tell you kind of a guide on how to influence a market. But um, the most important or the the biggest misunderstanding I think a lot of people have about influencer marketing is that you, once you find an influencer, that's who you need to work with forever. 
you don't n- need to look any further. For example, and I'm talking about the bigger influencers, people with a million followers, people who are going to charge that 20000 or you know million dollars for uh, a post on their page. Mm-hmm. But if you find people like... Um, the Kardashians or even, you know, some of those higher tier influencers that are not necessarily considered celebrities, um, you are limiting yourself to micro influencers who are the people that we deal directly with. Micro influencers are usually people who have less than 50 K followers. Um, they might not be at the hundred K mark, but they have a high engagement rate. They, their audience is super engaged. Their audience really cares about what they're doing and they have a very niche community, whether they're a chef and they're, you know, at 10 K followers, but they have maybe 4,000 likes on each photo and people are looking for their recipes every day. So I think brands a lot of times make a misstep because they want to work with a huge chef maybe instead of looking for those micro influencers who might give them a more direct uh, sales pipeline to regular people who are like, oh, I follow this X person's content and I make his recipes every day. And if he suggests he uses craft, I'm going to use craft, you know? Mm -hmm. So that I think is, I think brands not necessarily realizing that numbers are not the most important and kind of boxing themselves in with those bigger influencers is limiting them to the micro influencer space, which I think is is blowing up a little bit more now. That's such a great point. And I think, too, for even people just, you know, everyday people who are looking at other people's followers and, oh, they have so many, but also what I've been told by some other social media, quote unquote, experts is, but who are the people who are following? You know, like you said, if it's everyday people, but those are everyday people who make the recipe and buy whatever that person says, they may be of more, you know, value to a brand as opposed to just people who are following because it's pretty pictures or everyone because everyone else is following. So I I would imagine there's a lot you look into other than numbers. Yeah, that's so important. What would you say as far as um, or would you say that Shade is the business that is sort of pushed ahead of uh, Boogie or do they work in tandem? And I ask that because a lot of us and I've done this, too. You have a business that you're working on. You put something else out either as a campaign or a test or a C and it sort of moves ahead of the other business. And I feel like I did that with support is sexy, sort of the thing that really caught on and people have really been drawn to, thank goodness. Um, yes. And that I'm, and that like you said, this was started as a passion project. It's something women entrepreneurs is something I'm very passionate about. So for you, has Shade sort of been the business that you all have been really funneling your attention to or do the, they work in tandem? Yeah, that's an actually, that's an awesome question. Very recently, we made a decision internally um, that we were going to focus more of our resources on shade and that was exactly the reason it it took off and it wasn't something that we necessarily expected and Mm -hmm. it wasn't something that we were planning for but it's it's very it's kind of something that you can't necessarily box in it's a little bit bigger than what we are we even imagined imagined Mm -hmm. it to be it's bigger for people in terms of the effect that it, that um, we hope to have on the industry, but it's also bigger for those influencers who have been, people ha- have emailed me, like, I've been looking for something like this for a long time, and I'm glad that you guys created it. Um, even other people at agencies saying, like, wow, why didn't we think of this? So um, I, I definitely think that uh, we have started shifting our resources a little bit um, more from Boogie to Shade, um, but we were actually um, moving into more of a consultancy basis for Boogie anyways, so this was like perfect timing. Mm -hmm. Uh, As we're moving into consultancy for Boogie, we're less hands-on when it comes to that, but we're focusing, like our business development director who primarily worked for Boogie is now focusing all of his resources on Shade. Um, You know, primarily, not all of them, but primarily, like 75% he's focusing on Shade and 25% on Boogie. And that's something that we decided to do very, very recently in the last few weeks because we saw that the campaigns that we've been working on with Shade, one, have been, you know, had a quicker turnaround. So for, for those of us in business, we understand that certain, like pitching, when it comes to pitching, you you may be pitching for a month, <laughs> you could be pitching for three months, mm-hmm. or you could be pitching for two weeks. So you never know when it comes to certain things like that. And when we, uh, you know, identified the sales funnel for uh, Boogie, we realized that it is a very long-term business. Whereas for Shade, not only are we doing something that we love, but it is a very quick turnaround, a business where someone will contact us on a Friday and a campaign will start on a Monday. 
So uh, th this is something that we do need all hands on deck for because Otherwise, it won't be successful if we don't. Uh, so we did start shifting focus uh, a little bit more to shade. And I think I love it. I, like I said, it's my passion project. Yeah, so I can I'm hear it. I love it, too. <laughs> it's a great idea. And thank you for sharing sharing that the, the, the fact that you did do that pivot, because just in talking to you about it and the two companies, and I, as I said, thinking about my own journey. And I remember um, this woman that I look up to, a serial entrepreneur, Jen Groover, when I first mentioned uh, Support is Sexy as an idea to her. And I had my other company and she mentioned that sometimes as entrepreneurs, especially serial entrepreneurs, you go through mm -hmm. that something's an idea or you have a vision or a passion and you put it out there and you sort of see it moving ahead of the other thing. And that's OK. And I know yeah. for me, I don't know if you went through this, but in the beginning, it was hard for me to shift. But I because I was thinking, no, but this other thing is the thing sort of like this is the first yeah. baby. It has to be, you know, yeah. you know, the other I've one. I've been working on it for so long. Exactly. And, yeah. 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 But it's sort of like, but this is what the audience wants. And it's still an alignment, alignment with who you are. So it's not like you're doing something totally different. But just to, to re, uh, remind people or tell people that it's OK to do. In fact, it's important to do that, to pivot and evolve ha as your business evolves. Yeah, I definitely I, I mean, 100 percent. You you said it. You hit the nail on the head. I, <laughs> I actually failed to mention that it was it was very hard for us to decide, OK, we're going to slow down a little bit on Boogie because I, I mean, I said to my husband, I was like, wait, how? Mm -hmm. But we've been working on this for years. Like, we can't, we can't do that because Boogie is funding Shade, right? Like, mm -hmm. right. <laughs> at, at this point, when, when Shade is being able to sustain itself, we have to realize that, you know, sometimes you do have to put, you know, that other company, that other baby right. on the back a little bit so that you can um, nurture this new one. And sometimes those things or that baby, if you will, gave birth to this new thing. You know, you're working right. on that and it's sort of, it's a very weird baby analogy, but yes, everybody gets yeah. it. <laughs> Excellent. So what would you say, Daisha, entrepreneurship has taught you about yourself as a woman? Wow. Um, everything. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I did not know who I was as a person, as a woman, until I became an entrepreneur because there are such trying moments um, in this journey, um, things that are like extremely stressful or extremely positive and make you so happy. Um, so I think the, the ups and downs of entrepreneurship have taught me everything I need to know about myself. And I'm still learning every single day. Um, like I said, I'm only 25. So there, there are a lot of mistakes that I've made and a lot of mistakes to be made, um, especially in the industry uh, that we work in right now. But I, I'm i actually 26. That's so funny. I've been saying that I'm 25. Oh, I just, you're forgetting already? I, <laughs> I do that now, but that's, that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> I just turned 26 in May. Wow. Okay. So, um, yeah, but I think um, as a woman, it's taught me how resilient, resilient I am. I used to cry for everything. And I actually probably still do cry mm -hmm. for everything. But um, just letting myself know that it, it's okay to be emotional. It's mm -hmm. okay to get sad or it's okay to be stressed out. As long as you find a solution to that problem and you don't let it kind of overcome you or overtake you, I think it's okay. And I've been being a little bit more gentler with myself uh, after becoming a quote unquote entrepreneur and identifying that I, nothing is perfect and I'm never going to be perfect. Um, and there are going to be mistakes that are made and we just have to roll with the punches, figure out the solution. And this is something that I learn literally, I have to remind myself every day. That's a beautiful thing though. It's a beautiful lesson to learn. Yeah, definitely. Well, what does your um, support network look like? Uh, that's important. Um, well, besides my husband, who is literally my rock, um, I tell him he's like my venting ear. Um, that's all I do, vent to him. But um, besides him, I have a lot of family and friends who are in the marketing space, um, specifically one of my best friends, um, Nieves, she is like my anchor. Um, she's always like, Daisha, you're, you can do it. You know, you, you're, you're great. And you've shown me X, Y, and Z. So I think with, um, some of the things that I've been through, having someone who can understand the industry and understand what I'm talking about when I'm using certain jargony words, uh, that most people don't 
really understand when it comes to marketing or owning a business. Uh, being able to share those things with someone who understands me directly, I think, is super important. Um, but my family, like, they have been nothing but supportive of me in this journey and, you know, understanding that sometimes I have to be up until four o'clock in the morning. And even though I said I was going to meet you guys at dinner or brunch or something, I'm going to be sleeping because mm -hmm. I'm super tired. Um, so then being understanding about that and even just like sometimes my friends would say like, let's go out and I'm like, oh, I have a lot of work to do. And they're like, okay, let's just have a working inside party. And like everyone brings their laptops and just hangs out in my house. So I think um, having people around you that understand the work that you do and are there emotionally for you. Um, and the, my friends and my family have done that, you know, more than I could even ever ask or think or imagine. And yay, Nieves, we love her. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the one who said, you have, to, you have to check out Daisha. I was like, oh, <laughs> send me, send me info. <laughs> yeah, she's amazing. And she loves the Port of Sexy. She's been telling me. She's, oh. Every time she listens to a new podcast, she's like, here, listen to this. But the Port of Sexy <laughs> has been like, tried and true, has been like on her playlist. Oh, good. Very good. I have to send her a thank you note. <laughs> so in closing, Daisha, if you think over your life and career, and you had the chance to thank only one person, whose support was critical to you personally or professionally, who would that be and what would you say? Wow, one person. Sheesh. Um, I would definitely say my husband. Um, I think he is the reason I am an entrepreneur uh, or the entrepreneur that I want to be, not necessarily something that I didn't, didn't want to do. Um, he helped me to discover what was important to me um, as I was growing and kind of finding myself in college. Um, and he, his support or his being there, being supportive of my decisions, some of the things that maybe he's not necessarily 100%, he doesn't 100% agree with, um, but he, him supporting me and um, knowing that I would make the best and, you know, the proper decision for myself and for our companies. I think his support is just priceless. I don't know what I would do without it. I think there are a lot of people who maybe battle where maybe there are two entrepreneurs in the household, um, husband and wife, or, you know, boyfriend and girlfriend, whatever the case may be, but they might battle for time um, where one person is up late and the other person, you know, maybe doesn't understand that or is not able to cope with that non-traditional form of working. Um, he's been super, super supportive. When I'm tired, he's like, go to sleep. It can wait. <laughs> right. um, you know, when I need to stay up, he's burning the mid midnight oil with me. You know, it's very, 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 um, it's something that I didn't even know I needed until, mm -hmm. you know, I was actually reflecting on this the other day with um, my family, I was like, wow, I don't know where I would be without him. So I thank you, Dave. <laughs> oh, so sweet. I love it. Thank you for sharing that with us. No worries. Thank you. So now tell us how we can support you. Of course, I'll have links to the website and everything, social media, but let us know where to find you and anything else you want us to know about. Oh, of course. Okay. So you can find us at shade.co. Um, you can also find us on Instagram at Shade MGMT, Shade Management. Um, like our Instagram photos, uh, follow us on Instagram. We definitely appreciate the love on Twitter as well. Um, we actually will be launching a survey for black com consumers very, very soon. Um, and we'll post that out on most of our social media pages. And um, if you guys could take the survey, that would be awesome as well. Uh, so that when that goes live, we'll do that. Um, but yeah, thank you guys for listening. Um, thank you so much, Elaine, for having me on the podcast. This was an amazing experience. Thank you. You're fantastic. I have so many more questions, but I can ask you later. No, was, <laughs> it was fantastic. I appreciate you. And if and when you have the survey done, too, if you want to send it to me, I'll make sure I put it on your show notes page because people, people will be listening to this, you know forever yeah so, future, yeah. yeah so let me know so now before you go Daisha what's a parting piece of advice from you to our listeners about anything about anything um the best advice that I have right now and that I'm still taking myself and learning to take myself 
is to care for yourself. Um, stop for a moment every single day um, and do something that you love. Do something that's not work related. Um, connect or reconnect with your family and friends. Um, whether you know, sometimes you don't realize the joy that you find in uh, doing that. But um, do something that you love and do something for you. Excellent. I love it. Do something that you love and for you. Daisha, thank you so much. Hold on for just a second. All right. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Daisha. Again, for more and the resources that she mentions in this episode, you can go to supportissexypodcast.com. Just go to the search icon at the top and type in Daisha. D-A-H-C-I-A and her show notes page will pop up with the resources, the links there. Also, how to get in touch with Shade and find out more about the company, what they're up to. I absolutely love what they're doing. So be sure to check them out. Also, do me a favor and let me know how I can better help you. Help me help you. And you can do this by going to supportissexysurvey.com. So that's supportissexy, S-U-R-V-E-Y.com. If you're an entrepreneur, if you're getting your side hustle on, if you just got an idea or you're already in full swing, I want to know the best ways to support you on your journey. They say the best way to find out what someone needs is to ask, right? My favorite five words. Tell me what you need. So I would like you to tell me what you need. The survey only takes five minutes or less. It's been timed. Five minutes or less, just a few questions, multiple choice, really simple. You can do it from your desktop, from your phone, from wherever. Answer those few questions for me. Let me know what you think. It's completely anonymous unless you want to leave your contact information. And I may follow up with you just to ask a few more questions. But either way, you know, I love to hear from you in any kind of way. But I definitely want to get your feedback on this survey. The only way I know the best way to support you is if you tell me. All right. So thank you all so much for listening. As always, I truly appreciate you as we go into our one year mark with the Support is Sexy podcast. It has been an amazing experience and I know it's only going to get bigger and better, more powerful and more helpful as I continue to create things that I hope will help women, women in business continue to move forward all around the world, right? We're putting it out there into the universe. That is the intention. So I thank you so much for being a part of of this journey. All right. So until we talk again next time, you know what to do. Go out there and create something sexy and I'll talk to you soon. Take care.